What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Richard on Data. And if this is your first time here, my name is Richard, and this is the channel where we talk about all things data, data science, statistics, and programming. So subscribe for all kinds of content just like this, and hit that notification bell so you never miss an update. This is another video in my R tutorial series. And now if you've seen some of the older videos, we've worked through a number of libraries from the tidyverse. We've seen dplyr, ggplot2, tidyr, lubridate, stringr, and basically we've got down a number of functionalities like manipulating your data and getting it into a nice format so that you can visualize it, and then also some different functionalities for just dealing with different types of data. Well, today we're going to take another step back from that, and we're going to look at things like functions, and then how you can apply those functions over multiple different elements or vectors. Now, just a few things before we get started. Number one, please take half a second of your time to smash the like button, because that really does help my content reach a larger audience. I will also have a link to my Patreon account in the description of this video, so if you guys would be willing to support me over that way, that would be massively appreciated. And then also, this script, as always, is going to be available on my GitHub repo, which is also in the description of this video. Now, without further ado, let's get started. So what I want to start off with here is sort of the motivation for writing functions in the first place. And I'm going to show you this by first pulling in the empty cars data sets that's available from the tidyverse. And I'm going to create a data frame called, uh, in this case, data set. So I'm going to showcase why functions are important by sort of showing you a counterexample. So check out what I'm doing in this next chunk of code here. So I'm creating these three variables, zdisp, zhp, and zdrat, by basically creating zscores out of the different variables that I have here. But there's a few problems here. First of all, if you just look at this code, it's a little bit difficult to read. Now granted, what I'm doing here is not exactly massively complex, but when you look at this, your eyes are on all these variables which are showing up. You've got data set dollar sign disp minus the mean of data set dollar sign disp all divided by the standard deviation of data set dollar sign disp. It's just the same thing going on over and over again, just repeating this variable and it's a little bit ugly on the eyes. And not only that, but if you look at my uh, third line of code here, I don't know if you caught it, but there's actually a typo in it. So I was copying and pasting this line down and then I missed the data set dollar sign HP at the end, which really should be a dollar sign DRAT. That can happen to you too. You can be repeating your code over and over like this and then you end up making typos and other mistakes like that and it just causes you problems. So a good rule of thumb, this is what I like to call the Hadley Wickham rule, but if you're repeating your code more than twice, it makes sense to write a function instead. So what I'm gonna do here as an, as an alternative is I'm gonna start by, I'm gonna start by calling this chunk of code, first of all, but I'm going to start by refreshing my data set here because I made changes to it. Then I'm just gonna create this function called standardize. I'm going to just create some new variable y that's equal to given some input x x minus the mean of x divided by the standard deviation of x return that new y variable that's all there is to it and now i'm going to just call this standardized function here three times and just look at this it's so much cleaner and easier to read than all this junk up here was because over here, when your emphasis was on these variables, which just kept getting repeated over and over, over here, the emphasis for your eyes when you see this is on this function that's being done. So it's just much, much better. I know this is a very simple example, but I hope it really does impress upon you just how useful writing functions is. Now, the next thing that I'm gonna show you are loops. So the two key types of loops in R are the for loop and the while loop. We're gonna start with the for loop, and I actually wanna preface this by saying, 
I use loops all the time, but whenever possible, I recommend not using them. Now, we're going to see why towards the end, but first of all, with loops, they're not the fastest way of applying a function over multiple elements. And frankly, because of just the beautiful vectorized nature of R, you just don't need to deal with loops all that frequently. So again, you're going to see that towards the end, just alternatives that we have to using loops. But like I said, I do them sometimes, you'll probably do them sometimes, and you need to know them. So I'm going to show you a super simple example. I started by uh, calling this data set and isolating the variables that I need. So I've got a number of uh, quantitative variables here and I just want to do something super simple. All that I want to do is create a vector and then every element of that vector stores the mean of one of these variables. So okay, that's pretty straightforward, right? So let's start by initializing this vector. We're gonna call it call means and the length of this vector is going to be equal to the number of columns of this data set. So again, one element uh, for each of these variables. So here's our syntax for a for loop. It's going to iterate through one up to the number of columns in the data set. And you can call it whatever you want. Your iterator here, I'm just gonna call it i. But then call means for every index i is going to be equal to the mean of the ith column of this data set, okay? So we're gonna run this and look at that. We've got a, we've got a vector that uh, has all of our column means. Now one pretty nice thing that you can do with for loops is you can nest them. And I'm gonna show you an example uh, with a matrix here. So I'm gonna create just a straight up empty matrix. I mean, technically it's not empty because I'm just creating the number zero uh, in a five by five matrix. But what I'm gonna do is I'm going to replace these zeros with the row and the column index for each of the elements of the matrix. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to iterate through all the rows of the matrix using an iterator uh, called I then inside of that, I'm gonna iterate through all the columns of the matrix. I'm gonna call the, uh, the iterator here J. And then for the ith uh, row and jth column element, I'm just going to paste the text of the row iterator, comma, the column iterator. So let's just take a look at that and see that it works. We're gonna do that and in the first row, uh, first uh, column, we've got one comma one. For the, let's say, third row, second column, we've got three comma two. Pretty straightforward, right? So now that hopefully you get the idea behind for loops, let's take a look at while loops. Now, I created an example here, which was heavily influenced from this example that I found from uh, this website, guru99.com. I think this is a really practical sort of example when you might want to use a while loop uh, in a more practical sense. But let's take a look at this example here, and we're actually going to uh, start from the variables I'm declaring, then we're going to look inside this loop. So I'm going to initialize this variable called stock. Let's say that's just a stock price. Uh, we're going to start with days equal one, and then I'm going to set the random seed here for reproducibility purposes to be 555. And now inside of this while loop here, I want to iterate uh, over the stock variable here. I want to add to the stock variable uh, some random noise based on a uniform uh, random variable going from a minimum of negative five to 20. So just basically adding a random noise here that is expected to be positive. And then this days variable, I'm going to increase it. So that's all going to occur while the stock variable is less than 350. So I wanna basically find out how many, let's say days, or runs of this loop rather that it takes uh, for the stock price to hit 350. So we're gonna do that. And um, yeah, it basically takes uh, six days here and the stock price at the end was 353.2. So that's pretty cool stuff, right? 
Now, while loops, I don't personally use them a whole lot. When I do use loops, I use for loops uh, significantly more, but like you just saw here, there are certainly some instances in which you're uh, going to want to know about them. Now, there are some other types of control statements out there uh, inside of R. We've got next, we've got repeat, and we've got break. Now, these things are fairly straightforward, and again, these are not things that I happen to use a whole lot. But they are out there and they'll help you uh, control your loops. So I'm not going to show you examples of them here, but you should have them on your radar just to know that they exist. And then if you need to incorporate them into a loop sometime, again, I think they're pretty straightforward to figure out. One control statement that I am going to show you here, though, is the if-else statement, because I use this one all the time. So the if-else function has three uh, arguments to it. There's a logical condition that you're going to check if it's true or not. If it's true, it's going to evaluate to the second argument. And if it's false, it's going to evaluate to the third argument. So what I want to do here is I just want to create uh, this variable HP above average, which is going to be equal to true if the Z score, ZHP, is greater than or equal to zero and false otherwise. So I'm just going to run this. Bam, I created this HP above average variable pretty quickly. We see in these instances in which the ZHP is less than zero, uh, it evaluates to false, and when it's greater than zero, it evaluates to true. So again, pretty easy to figure out, uh, and it's a function that I use all the time. All right, so that's about it for loops and control statements. Now, the last thing that I want to show you here is the apply family of functions. And I must say, this is absolutely one of my favorite types of functionalities in R. I highly recommend getting used to these because when you can use these to replace a for loop, pretty much always you should because they're significantly faster and they're just a lot more syntactically uh, concise than writing loops. And so the idea here is, we're going to apply a function over something else. So we're basically going to repeat a function multiple times, and we're gonna see some examples of this. So we're gonna start with this base apply function. Now, what I'll say about this is, I've got the help documentation open in the, uh, in the corner here. You might not be able to see it because my face is in the way. What I'll say is, it is a little bit hard to read at first. I totally understand that. So I'm going to try to break it down for you here. For the apply function, there are three key arguments here. Number one is your data frame. Then number two is your margin. And that's either going to be the rows or columns. If you want the rows, you put one here. If you want the columns, you put two. Then the third argument is a function that you want to apply over that margin. So that is simple enough, right? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do apply dataset to mean. So I want to apply the mean function over the columns of this dataset. I do that. And I basically produce, just like I did before, uh, the means of all the columns of the data frame. But notice, this is one single line of code. That was faster and just frankly a lot easier uh, to read and to write than that for loop that I showed you before. There's plenty of other functions in this family, and I'm going to show you two of them here. That's lapply or sapply. Uh, you may hear me calling them laply or sapply just because you can pronounce them, but just know that's what I'm referring to. Now there's some others in this family that I'm not gonna show you, like V apply, T apply, and M apply. But again, the two most common that I use are L apply and S apply. And it's easiest to see how these work by seeing an example. So I'm gonna start by creating this list called X. I basically ripped this kind of from the help documentation for, uh, for these functions. But it's gonna be a list where the element A is a vector going from 1 to 5. We've got uh, this element beta, which is an exponent going from negative 3 to 3. And then we have this logic vector, which is true, false, false, true. Okay? So what this L apply function is going to do is it's going to apply the mean function to each element of this list. 
Let's run that and let's look at it. Okay, so of element A, we got a mean of three. Of this element beta, we got a mean of 4.535. And of logic here, it sort of converted these to numbers on the back end and it returned a mean of 0.5. So I'm returning singular values here, but LApply does, is not uh, constrained to that. You can return whole vectors here. So rather than apply the mean function to each element of x, I'm going to apply the quantile function. I'm going to pass another argument to LApply here with the probabilities, or the probs. That's an argument to the quantile function, which is passed as an additional argument to LApply here. Let's see what we get. Look at that. We got the 25, 50, and 75 quantiles for, uh, for each of the elements of x. So this is an absolutely awesome function, and the possibilities for it are completely endless. You will see here that LApply returned us a list. Now, what's nice about the SApply uh, function is that after it creates this list here, it's pretty smart, and where applicable, it's going to convert your output into either a vector or into a matrix. So let's see an example here. I'm going to run S apply instead of L apply for that example with the mean. And now instead of a list, I have a named uh, numerical vector. Similarly, for that quantile example, I'm going to use S apply, and I have a named matrix here instead of just a list. So. Super, super helpful function. Again, I use these constantly. So I'm gonna wrap this up by sort of bringing all this full circle. So remember right at the beginning of this tutorial when I created that standardized function and then I used it three times, one time for different variables of the uh, data set that I was working with that I wanted to create z-scores based off of? So let's take making our code concise to the next level. So let's just say I want to use the sapply function over the data set, specifically just over the vectors disp, hp, and drat. I want to apply the standardized function. So I turned three lines of code that I was using earlier into just one line of code here. So I'm gonna, that's gonna return me a matrix. I'm gonna convert that into a data frame and then I'm gonna give it uh, I'm going to give the columns names, output that, uh, that data frame, and then look at that. I did a lot there, and I took only four lines of code to do it. Now, if I just want to append this to, uh, to my data set, obviously that's pretty easy to do. So we've seen the motivation for creating functions here, and then how to use functions in an iterative fashion by using either loops or the apply family of functions. Now I want to point out, these are not the only way that we can skin this cat. There is the perr package as well as the furr package, which provide functionalities for us to do these types of things. But there's a lot going on behind those packages, so they're totally the subject for a different tutorial. Hopefully now you know how to use loops, and you're very familiar with the apply family of functions, because believe me, once you become an established R programmer, that family of functions is really going to be your friend. So thanks for watching this video. Leave me a comment down below, smash the like button, and then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.